Hey, what's going on, everyone? Before we get into our conversation, I want to let you know this podcast is sponsored by BetRivers.com. BetRivers.com, the best place for all your sports gambling needs. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. You can also watch all of these episodes on the Field of 68 YouTube channel. Now, let's get into our conversation. Hey, what's going on, everyone? This is Eric Devendorf, your host of the Sports Table Podcast. And today's guest is not a Syracuse guy, but he did play against Syracuse and is one of my really good friends. Uh, he, he, he was born in Benton Harbor, Michigan, uh, played at DePaul for two seasons, uh, and he played 13 years in the league for the Knicks, Nuggets, Sixers, Clippers, and Nets. And in those 13 years, averaged eight or averaged uh, double figures in eight of the 13 seasons. And those, out of those four seasons, one was a lockout. Um, one was his rookie year. And then the other ones, he was injured. So that's pretty fucking impressive to average double figures uh, eight out of the uh, 13 years. So my guy, Wilson Chandler, appreciate you coming on, bro. I appreciate y'all guys having me, man. Looking forward to it. Man, all good, all good. Damn, you got that. You got that cut too. Shit, I <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, bro, let's kick it off, man. Just just start back home uh, in Ben Harbor and just kind of talk about your journey. Uh, you know how you started playing ball. Who who introduced you to the game? And um, yeah, how, how did that get going? So for me, uh, I guess I got to tell my grandmother's and uh, and grandfather's story. Uh, my grandmother's from Missouri and my grandmother from Arkansas. And they met down there. Um, and then eventually they moved up north uh, to work in factories and all that. Uh, so that's how they got to Michigan. But uh, growing up, my grandma was a big Bulls fan. She loved Michael Jordan. So that was like that whole thing. Like me, I was, man, seven, eight. And she would watch faithfully. You know, I would go in the house. I would watch the Bulls with her. She would watch literally every game. Because on that side of the state, we were so close to Indiana and Chicago, we got WGN. So right. they showed all the Bulls games. So she was my first introduction. She actually played in high school and won a state championship. So she was my first introduction to basketball. Okay. So when, I guess, when did you really know uh, that this is what you wanted to do? Like at what age? And you're like, all right, I'm, I'm pretty good at this. Uh, you know how, you know how I go. Like when you're a kid, you always like, I'm gonna play in the NBA, I'm gonna play in college, but you just a kid. So you just saying like kid things. So when I was younger, my grandma, grandfather used to always tell me, I used to say crazy uh, stuff like, oh, when I make my first hundred dollars, I'm gonna buy you a car. But I'm like five or six, like, you know, a hundred dollars <laughs> can't get you much, right? <laughs> and, um, but I think, uh, honestly, when I, when I started playing AU, AU with you guys and uh, with the Hurricanes and just seeing the level, seeing the level of competition, that kind of inspired me like, damn, I got to get better. You know what I mean? Um, and I, when I got to college and I was like, man, I think I could, you know, I could play with these guys. I could play in the league, you know, if I wanted to. So that, I think college was like it. So, so talking about, well, shit, it probably should have been before college because you yeah. used all, a parade All-American, you used round ball classic yeah. All-American. But talk going back to uh, playing AAU, because I remember first meeting you, I think it was, yeah. we were probably like 13, 14, and it was at the Spice. I think it was at yeah. the Spice tournament in Indiana because you was really playing at first with the Mustangs, with Norm, right? No, what's crazy is I played that one tournament with the Mustangs. Okay. And and uh, I think somehow Will or Greer seen me play then, and they came down a bit hard, but, like, showed me, like, the mixtape with, like, Jay Ridge and <laughs> Tolbert and Whaley and Robe and all those guys on there. And I'm like, man, you know what? I'll be there. But uh, before that, I was just playing locally. I was playing with a team out of Kalamazoo, like, local tournaments called the Kazoo Blues. I think the furthest we traveled at that time was Detroit, but most of the tournaments was right in Kalamazoo. And um, I played with Norm and them up in Grand Rapids okay. that weekend. But that was it. That was just that tournament that I started playing with you guys. The Storm Classic. Yeah, yeah. The Storm, Storm Classic. Classic. I played with them that weekend. That was the only time I played with them. I left. Like, literally, like, grid came down, like, two days after that. And I started playing with the Hurricanes. Yeah, that's what, you know, that's what they do. They go down there and, and yeah, the whole recruit. <laughs> yeah, the whole recruitment thing. Yeah. Man, them motherfuckers ain't shit. You, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you need to come play with us. Yeah, you try to get a kill mode or what? 
Yo, bro, I'm talking about, the, I, the, I remember like when I was playing, but then like I was for the, with the family too. Like, so, so for those who don't know, like the Michigan Hurricanes and the family and the Michigan Mustangs, those were like the three big, big time AAU teams growing up in Michigan. So they had that little tension between each other, I guess. You yeah, know, the rivalry. Right. What's crazy, right. what's crazy is the family is the only one that still exists. The family is the only one that still Nike, yeah. right? And I played, Nike, so yeah. I, I went and practiced with them when I was playing with the Hurricanes because, and just for like a weekend with like Joe Malik, Joe Crawford, Malik Harrison, uh, yeah. then had Romar and all them. But I remember uh, Will and Greer like making a big fit out of it, calling my mom, What the fuck is he going down? He was <laughs> there, like, you know what I'm saying? But like, yeah. those, those dudes was. I mean, that's how it was, man. They was like talking yeah, yeah. about motherfuckers and all type of shit. Yeah, yeah. And you, man, very political. You know, at that time, like you was, you was it. Like, you was like, you know, our, like, you know, you was all American. Like, you was the only all American we had at the time. So it's like they can't lose you. So it's like, man, what is he doing? No, but I remember that first tournament, bro, in Indiana yeah. in speech, like. Cause I didn't know you, but Will was telling yeah. me like, "All right, we got a good one, man. We, we gonna be good." And then I remember that first one. We were playing in that side gym where it goes like, and it's yeah. like this, it was going like this. Yeah. Man, I remember you going and you was just killing, bro. And then from then on, like all, all the tournaments we was playing in, like when we played in uh, uh, Jersey after the ABCD camp and all that, we, we was like, we was all together. We was always together throughout those, those summers, nah. all those camps. Nah, that's a fact. That was the first time, like, besides, like, high school, I was, like, around guys playing basketball and traveling, like, kind of, like, building that family foundation. And my whole thing was just, like, to get better because I seen how guys in AAU were, like, from different states and cities, like, how boy, I'm like, man, I need to be on A level. Like, you know what I mean? So that was my whole thing, just to get better. I used that to get better. Like, I think I went, in, I went into that uh, that first tournament in space. I was unranked, obviously. Um only ranked in the state, but I left there like top 100 in the nation. You know I mean, for me, that was a, a huge deal. You know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah big time. Cause yeah. you know, we was looking at them, them motherfucking Michigan preps, prep spotlight, you know, yeah. with, that, with yeah. like, all those rankings. And we was always like, like through, I think, guess throughout our high schools, me and you were always like one and two or Chris Douglas. And yeah, then, I, I would, I think at first, like when I first started to really pay attention, I was like top 10, maybe like nine or something like that. But you and Chris Doug was always one and two. And I think I creeped up and it was like one, two, three, like depending on that. Like you were always number one. And then when you left, it was actually good. <laughs> but you went to Oak Hill. So now <laughs> just me and Chris, <laughs> that was just me and Chris Doug, you know, and then he transferred too. So that gave me a little leverage, you know what I mean? So, yeah. Yeah. So, well, so after playing at Speast and you talked about, you know, ranked in the country after that. What yeah. was your recruitment like? You know what I mean? Because then now it's starting to. Because yeah. they see they they send in letters automatically after they see you play well in, in a tournament like that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it picked up. It just you know at that time I just really didn't like my grandmother and my grandfather were old by the time I came around. So like far as like school and stuff like that, they would like you know want me to do good, but I just really didn't have like that push, you know what I mean? So my grades wasn't like up to par, like, you know, um, so schools would come and they would look and they'd be like, well, is he gonna make it to the college or whatever? But at that time, I think I started to get more bigger, uh, bigger schools, Michigan State, Ohio State, you know, stuff like that, uh, more local. Um, I really didn't have any big schools that was far. I really wanted to go to Notre Dame. <laughs> and uh, they never, they, yeah, they, it's right there, it's right down the street from where I grew up, 30 minutes. 45 minutes, but they never offered me a scholarship. Um, but yeah, I had like, you know, Michigan State, Ohio State, DePaul, of course, um, Xavier, stuff like that. So some pretty good programs for real. But when you, so but so we played in the round ball classic game and shit, yeah. you got, damn, you had like 15 or something in that game. And we was playing with like, that was like Brandon Rush. Like that was the, it was the McDonald's and then that game for real. Because yeah, then was, it, yeah, I think then you had, you had McDonald's, of course, and you had Round Ball. And you might have had Jordan. I don't remember. You might have had Jordan. Yeah, you did. Know. You have Jordan. Okay. But Jordan was as, it wasn't as big as it, it is now. Right. Round Ball was like the second, you know, biggest thing, you know, because, you know, Sonny Baccaro, of course, you know, uh, ABCD and all that. And that was yeah, in but, at the United States. Yeah, that was in Chicago. Yeah. yeah. So I had a bunch of guys come down for that from the crib and from Chicago. So that was dope. 
So, but after that, like after that game, you playing so well against like the best competition in the country. Was it like did did it, you get start getting more offers after that game? Yeah, uh, more colleges called, but at that time I was already committed to uh, already DePaul committed. already. Yeah, so I committed to DePaul going into my senior year, the summer of my junior year. What was your top five? Shit, I didn't have. I had three. I had DePaul, Ohio State, and Michigan State. DePaul, Ohio State, Michigan State. And was you just giving yeah. Michigan State that courtesy? No, I uh, like out, outside of uh, Notre Dame, like Michigan State for me was it. But, you know, like politics, the AAU and all that, you know, stuff I can't say, you know, DePaul yeah. was the choice. <laughs> I mean, bro, yeah. I committed. I I, com I was committed. To yeah, Michigan. I remember, yeah. I, I went yeah. on my visit and Will and them there, and I'm talking about, as I'm going up to talk to Izzo, Will and them like, don't commit. <laughs> he's, like, don't, he's like, don't commit. I come down, I committed, man. I just got, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yo, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But they didn't like, I, I don't, like you said, whatever was going on, yeah, Michigan you know, State like wasn't the where they could, shit. Yeah, they couldn't control it, or so, I guess, yeah. right? Or they yeah, never, so the same. The guys. Yeah, so the same thing. I verbally committed to Michigan State, like, you know, toe is or whatever. And I remember I was uh I had just got on the highway to go to a football game in Michigan State. And Will called me on the phone, like, what the fuck are you doing? I told your dumb ass. <laughs> <laughs> so like I tell my man, I'm like, man, just turn around, like, fuck it. And I just, I didn't really have a heart to tell him. So I just stopped. I just started ignoring like DJ is, I just ignored him. I never told him I wasn't coming. I just stopped answering the phone. Yeah, so I didn't have the courage to tell job. him. He, he just got the head coaching job at Western Michigan. Really? That's what's up. Yeah, yeah, congrats, yeah. congrats to him, man. Yeah. yeah that's big. No, that's funny, yeah. bro. Two guys, the top, yeah. some of the two, two of the top guys in the state, yeah. both verbally committing and then, and then decommit, man. Co coaches, yeah. I had to call coaches on the phone and tell them, "Hey, coach, man, I think you know, I just want to uh, open." Up my <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So <laughs> I'm 16, I, and he he like he told me, bro, that was probably the worst decision you know I I was gonna make in my life. I'm like, damn. I'm yeah. thinking, I'm like 16, <laughs> 16 years old. I got a lot more shit to do. That is, I'm gonna fuck up. You know what I mean? Yeah, but, yeah, he, definitely. That. But that's how serious that shit is, man. Like. Dog, like I seen Izzo a few times after that. I was in the NBA at the time. Like, like he wouldn't even acknowledge I was in the room. <laughs> but at least I guess at least you told him. Like you told him that like, you wasn't coming. I literally just like just ghosted everybody. Like I can't even face this man, dog. <laughs> Shit, it'd be it'd be times when when both of us in college was. Motherfuckers yeah. couldn't get a hold of us, you know? So it ain't, yeah. shit, you already know. That shit, we, yeah. that's just how it was sometimes. Let me tell you guys a little bit about our partners over at Bet Rivers Sportsbook. If you haven't signed up with Bet Rivers yet, now's the time. Because they are offering a $250 match bonus for your first deposit. But what sets them apart is that they require just one playthrough to turn your bonus into cash money. With their new Rush Pay Instant Approval, Withdrawing your winnings is safer, more secure, and more reliable. With basketball season right around the corner, there's never been a better time to get in on the action by going to betrivers.com. Today or downloading the BetRivers iOS app. Must be 21 years or older. Gambling problem? Call telephone number 1-800-GAMBLER. Yeah. So, you, so you get to DePaul, bro. You commit to DePaul. Um, mm -hmm. You only end up staying at two seasons before you yeah. go into the draft. But kind of talk about those two years because, I mean, we we played against each other and yeah. shit. You had you had some good memories against us, especially my freshman year when when we went there and you guys beat us by like fucking fifty points. And then yeah. <laughs> and then and then y'all came. I think it was maybe maybe my sophomore junior. I don't know which. It was sophomore, sophomore, sophomore. Yeah. And and then you you came and dunked on Terrence down the lane, but we ended up getting that getting yeah. that one right there. Well, talk about those two years at DePaul, man, and that overall experience just playing in the Big East. Uh, I think that was probably the best decision I made. You know, Michigan State a way better program than DePaul, but at that time, like I think for to showcase like my strengths in basketball, like the Big East was like way better. 
you know, we play four out, one in, we play up tempo. You know, I, I feel like most teams in the Big East at that time played a kind of faster pace uh, style of basketball. So I think just as far as that, it was much better. And um, we had, what, 16, 18 teams in that conference that year, those two yeah. years? It was yeah. a lot of schools. So I got to play against a lot of good talent. You know, we had uh, – we had you guys with Syracuse, y'all had a squad. UConn had Rudy Gay and all those guys. Villanova had Randy Foy and all those guys. Sumter, uh, you had Georgetown yeah. with uh, Jeff Green and, and uh, those guys. You had Louisville, you had Cincinnati, you had Marquette, you had Notre Dame. Yeah. You had, you know what I mean? You had a lot of good teams. So, like, I got to play against great teams every night, you know what I mean? So, it was, I was able to showcase, you know, uh, some of my talent, you know, and I think that was the biggest thing for me, just going out there and playing, like, to my strengths. I had a coach, you know, um, he just put me in the right position, you know, to play my game. And uh, I got a lot of comparisons at that time to uh, Sean Marion, you know, uh, which was a great player, you know, with uh, Phoenix. You know, I, I think, you know, that kind of helped me, you know what I mean? So when I got to, to, when I got to New York from there, you know, it kind of changed, you know, I had to kind of like grow up, you know, I had Isaiah Thomas, who was like a, you know, old school coach, you know, earn everything, you know, uh, young players got to earn everything, kind of slow the game down, I had time to think, you know, I didn't play a lot, you know, my uh, rookie year, so I had a lot of time to think about the game and just kind of how I can grow as an NBA player opposed to just like uh, running and jumping and dunking in college, you know what I mean? So. Yeah, so we talk about that because I think though, like what you said is important too, especially now. I think you see a lot more yeah. college players doing it, not just going to the school because of the because of the name, like a, a yeah. state or Syracuse or Kentucky, yeah. but going to where like they fit and then they could play yeah. and then they could, can show what you, what you do. So I think like that really worked out in your favor because now you're able to go out there to coach giving you a free the freedom just to go ahead yeah. and play, and then eventually. You know, your two years at DePaul ended up, you know, getting you drafted yeah. the first round by the Knicks. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it definitely worked out in my favor, and I think it started from just even like being when I was in high school and as a kid. Like, uh, like my grandmother, like she was a great person, but she wasn't super hands on when it came like to what I did with sports, you know, or anything uh, curricular activity. So, you know, um, I was able like with Will, you know, to choose like a school without having my parent like oh I need this or you got to have this education or whether it was money or whatever I was able to go somewhere like you know with the I had the freedom to go wherever I wanted you know without the pressure of my family for real so I was able to go to the Paul and I was able to like like you said like pick a school that was like a great fit for me. Like I played with JB, Jabari Curry, you know what I'm saying, AU with us. So he was yeah. my point guard. So, you know, we had that, you know what I'm saying, chemistry already, you know what I'm saying? I had a coach, you know, that believed in me uh, talent-wise and as a person. So like, it was just a great fit, you know, and it was an up-tempo, you know. Um, so it was, it was a great fit. So I think now, like a lot of kids, you see a lot of kids switch schools two, three times. Like, you know, a lot of kids go for the name, they go for whatever it is, the money or whatever it is. But if you think in long term, you know, you got to go to a school that's a great fit. Like, like what I'm trying to accomplish, you know, while I'm in school. You know what I mean? And obviously, some kids going to be great no matter where they go. You know, they're just, they're just that good. So, yeah, everybody's different. Facts. And you at your freshman year, you came in, like, right away at DePaul. So, average like, 10 yeah. points, 10 rebounds. Yeah. And then that second year, you averaged, like, I think almost 15 yeah. And, then, and then I remember that summer because every summer in between in uh in between um you know freshman sophomore year we go down to Atlanta, yeah. Uh, even in high school we go down to Atlanta and, and work out. And I remember after your sophomore year when we were down there, I, we, I remember working out and I remember Isaiah Thomas coming in the gym and they was and they was saying like already like, oh we gonna we gonna take Wilson. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So you kind of you kind of knew like beforehand, like what it was like when when people get those promises. Yeah, like you had, you already had that guarantee from them. Not not saying they couldn't change their mind and all yeah. that. I mean, yeah. I guess I guess knowing, but then when it happened, bro, like when it, when you hear your name called, like what's that? What's that feeling like, man? Of knowing like <laughs> all the hard work. You know what I'm saying? Like what's that feeling like, and what do you remember from that night? Uh. 
I gotta like rewind a little bit because when I when I left school, it's crazy because even even like the good years I had at DePaul, like, I I wasn't even on the draft board, right? But school never was my thing. So um, so when I left school, we we played the NIT, we lost. And then I see like the the second game of the NIT, and uh, so when I got back, I'm just like, man, you know, I'm just like this this school is not for me. Um, so I left school, and I remember like my coaches, like the local papers, the local Chicago papers, even Will and Greer, like, what the fuck, like you're not on the draft board. Why would you leave school? That's the dumbest shit ever. Like you're not even on that second round. That's the dumbest shit ever. And I was just like, man. So I was <laughs> <laughs> so I left school and I was home I went back to Ben Harbor and I was there for like a month maybe and they just called me like bro you got to do something like, if you're not gonna go back to school you got to put your name in the draft so I'm like I'm just gonna bet on myself I'm putting my name in the draft they was like literally the dumbest shit but whatever they was like don't they like don't sign a don't sign with an agent so you can go back to school I'm like nah I'm not going back to school so we might as well just go ahead and get the agent shit out the way so you know sign with Greer Go down to Atlanta, you know, work it out, like you said, uh, end up getting promise. And um, so the whole time I'm thinking, like, damn, they cannot like, really pick me for real. So I'm nervous the whole time. But when they called me, like, I didn't – I always got, like, this poker face. But inside, like, like dog, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm tearing up. I'm crying. Yeah. I'm screaming. Like, scream every emotion you can think of inside. Like, that's, that's what's going on inside. Uh, but definitely the best day of my life, uh, changed my life forever. Well, how did you know, like leading up to like, what did, cause I remember Zeke coming in watching workouts. Was it just yeah. that though? Like him coming in watching workouts? It was, yeah. Cause I mean, I guess, you know, after you see a guy in person and you like, damn, I really wasn't hip to him. Let me go back and watch film. You know, and I think he and the staff, they went back and watched film like, damn, like, you know what I mean? Like, he like a piece like, we, like he's not a star but he's a very solid role player like he's a good piece to a team so. but you look back bro when you was at DePaul yeah. and you see some yeah. of the highlights bro because DePaul wasn't yeah. on national tv and shit like that they no only yeah, every blue moon like maybe when we had in like Villanova or Syracuse like every blue moon like maybe four times when I was there you know what I mean right. so yeah but they was, but I'm saying like from your highlight, people weren't able to see what you was really doing. Like you, yeah. like even like a, a guy like you, you guarding, you could switch on pick and rolls, you could yeah. guard the four man, you could guard the three guy, and you could like you could switch on a point guard and, and a two guard and, and still be able yeah. to stay in front. Back then, like I guess the game was just starting to kind of Yeah, you only had a back then you only had a few. You had, like I said, you had Sean Mary and that's pretty like two way like you know as like on both ends like kind of like that that perfect role player make open threes run and jump block shots guard one through five like you didn't have many like you had some smaller players like ben wallace but he didn't he didn't switch one through five like you didn't have a lot of a lot yeah, of those players it. now you see yeah you yeah, yeah i mean yeah. Like, you know breaking up the court you know what i'm saying i wasn't like breaking nobody down off the dribble but definitely bringing up the court and you know make a smart decision for sure yeah but drive off the wing, go bang on yeah. somebody. Like you do it like them, like guys weren't really doing that a whole lot. Now more so everybody doing it, right? But you yeah. was like kind of, I guess you were still ahead of your time. Like you was a hybrid three. Like, you know what I'm saying? And you were yeah. stepping out and shooting that three. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's something that came over time. I didn't shoot threes in high school. I think I made a shot, maybe shot one three. And then even my freshman year, I didn't sh I think I shot zero threes. And then um I worked on it like uh, the summer before my sophomore year, and I still wasn't like comfortable with it. But once I got to the league, so the first year I had Isaiah Thomas, then you know I let him go, and then I got Dad Tony the second year. He would literally sub me out the game for not taking threes. Yeah, yeah. That's so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't love that shit. All right, coach. Yeah, That's yeah. yeah. Talk about your first year in New York, bro, because this was. Like you didn't play a whole lot, but you still averaged like seven, eight points as, yeah. as a rookie. But this was kind of yeah. like the first year that, you know, since high school that you really wasn't like playing like that. Yeah. You know? yeah. So so like, and I remember going down because I was still at Cuse, and I remember going down and, you know, kicking it with you and like you just being frustrated just off that. So like, talk about that transition, bro, in that first year from college to the pros, 
you know, you, you, you know, not playing as much as you're accustomed to. And yeah. like, what's, what really helped you like lock in bro. And like through those frustrating times. Man, that shit is so, so different. Cause you get there, you get drafted, you excited. And then you go to summer league, you work out, you go to summer league. So summer league, you know, of course I'm playing all the minutes. Like yeah. I'm playing good. It's summer league. So I'm thinking like, I know I'm going to play when the season comes. Like, I'm killing summer league. Like, you know what I mean? So the season come, we go down to Charleston for training camp, Charleston, South Carolina. Zeke like to have a training camp down there. So I know I, I feel like I did pretty good in training camp, you know, for a rookie. That was like the old training camp, twice a day, hard, grinded out, you know what I mean? But, you know, realistically, looking back at it now, like, why would I play? We had Stephon Marbury at the point, Jamal Crawford at the two, Quinn Richardson at the three, Zach Randolph at the four, Eddie Curry at the five. Yeah. Off the bench, we had Nate Robinson. We had fucking Fred Jones, uh, David Lee, Jared Jeffries, Malik Rose. Like, why would I play? Like, honestly, like, so like looking back at it, like I, I should have handled it differently. But it was it was just frustrating. It was depressing. Like, you know, just playing like all the minutes in high school and college, and just kind of having that opportunity. Like, you just like you take it for granted. Like, so I'm sitting there. I'm not playing. I'm literally in a suit. Like the first like thirty games. So I'm not even like, it's not even a possibility that I'm going to the You're game. Not even <laughs> yeah, I'm not even dressing. But um, it was definitely a good learning experience, though. Like, it was a lot going on off the court, you know, a lot of like negative energy with the Knicks around that time. So I was able to like sit back and kind of like watch like what to do, what not to do, like, um, as far as like with players and just management, kind of see like the whole like, landscape and just trying to like peep it from a distance like you know what i mean just sit back and look at it so it was it was like you know give or take you no know, it was good and bad so I, I i was able to pick like some good shit out of it too who who really helped yeah. you like during that year you know what i mean like was it was it a vet who really kind of yeah. helped you try to roll? yeah yeah no nah, definitely i think with me my personality being so quiet is just kind of like I was cool with everybody. So I, I got help from everybody. I, I mean, definitely uh, Eddie Curry and and, uh, and Quentin Richardson and Malik Rose. But, like, I mean, Jared, you know, helped me at times. Jamal Crawford helped me at times. Zach Randolph helped me at times. I think I was just cool with everybody. I literally didn't have, like, one run-in with or no arguments, anything with none of the players. Like, I was just cool with everybody. I think everybody helped me. Even Isaiah Thomas, like, he helped me a lot. Yeah, you ain't the type of dude to have no confrontations like like that. Yeah, like everybody was cool. It's crazy because I don't know. Like at that time, rookie, rookie Hazen was big, but they not not one time did they try to. I was thinking the whole time like they could have made me do some crazy shit, but not one time like nobody never was like rook do this, rook do that, and I don't know why they just never did. No, nah, they they could feel like now nah, we we cool. We ain't even we gonna yeah, do it because. Because the next year, the rookies we got, and the year after that, like they was making them do all type of shit. Yeah, like they gonna make they gonna make Landry Fields do some shit like that. <laughs> yeah, like well, fucking doing all type of shit. And I, and I was just thinking, I was just waiting for the day, like they do some crazy shit to me, and I was like, man, I am not with this shit. But they never did. But um, nah, a lot of people helped me around that time, and um, it was some good. Like you get a, the Knicks get a bad rep, you know, obviously um, some of it deservedly. But it was a lot of good people, not only on the team, but, you know, uh, in management and the staff, the coaching staff, that they helped me a lot, you know what I mean? So, Well, you talk about when D'Antoni came in, those, yeah. next, three, those next three seasons, uh, and then you guys, guys come in like uh, Amari. Um, yeah. But you was like, personally, you was on a whole different level. You know what I'm saying? Like that's yeah. like yeah. you was quoted, on, like you was, I think, 12, 14, and then that one of the years you was averaging like almost 17. Yeah. 30, 30 point games and, and that what changed, yeah. bro, for you, like, you know, from those from the first year to those next three? I think just the style of play, you know, uh Dan Tony was kind of more so what I did in college, you know what I'm saying? It was fast paced. Everything was quick, quick decisions. You like don't think about it. Either you if you got it, you drive it, you swing it, or you shoot it. Like don't play around with it. So that was my strength. Like I, I wasn't like a heavy dribbler. You know, um, I wasn't a point guard. So it was like quick decisions. And him just put me in those situations where I'm, I'm picking and rolling, I'm out of there, or I'm picking and popping, or I'm just spotting up for the shot. It was just everything was quick. It was fast paced. And it just played to my strength. Yeah, and he told me. He, 
good space. Yeah, the space. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, the spacing was amazing. Like Dan Tony was one of them guys. He was before his time. Like everything like the NBA does now, most teams he was doing them, but it was he was the only one, and he wasn't winning. Like he won and finished with it, but when he got to New York, he wasn't winning. So he got a bad rep. But he's one of the greatest coaches, in my opinion, just because he was one of the first people at that time, like to play that way. And he kind of like revolution, kind of revolutionized like the way like people play basketball. Now a lot of people they won't give him credit, but a lot of people run a lot of shit that he ran. That's a fact too. That's just my Raymond opinion. The, we had Raymond at the at the one too, so he was great. Yeah. yeah, we had we went through a we went through a transformation though, because we still with Zeke left, we still had that same team with with uh Steph and all those guys, and then they traded them, and we came in. We had uh, so they traded all them, and we they came in with. The, with Al Harrington and Larry Hughes and yeah. all those guys. And then like, then we traded them and then we got, you know, Amari and Raymond and that, that whole team. Yeah, so, and the teams we had before on paper were way better, but it's just for the office that he wanted to run and what he wanted to accomplish. Like, you know, having like a bunch of role players, like, because like, it's less confrontation. You know, you can have a role player pretty much do whatever you want them to do pretty much. So. You got Mari, who's having like the best year of his career, like stat wise. And you had a bunch of guys around him just happy to like be in that position, to be honest, playing hard. Was there a lot of guys when you was playing that was just happy with stats and they wasn't really caring about you? Ain't got to say no names, man, but it was just happy. Yeah, no, nah, you, you know what yeah, I mean? You get, you get guys that play for different reasons. You get guys when they play like for individual accolades, you know, some people for stats, uh, shit, some people for money. They got some guys that shit for the lifestyle, for real. You know what I mean? You, you run into a lot of different, you know, players in there. You got guys who just love it. Like, everything. Like, they eat, sleep, dream. Like, just basketball. It's life. Those like, are the two ones. people, two, yeah, three people, three people, I would say, that I played with that love the game the most was KD, uh, Jamal Crawford and Will Barton, like everything is like basketball. Will Barton killing right now too. Yeah, now Will Barton definitely. Uh, I didn't know much about him before he got traded to Denver. Like I obviously I knew him. And I thought he was pretty good, but when he got to Denver and I first seen him play, I'm like, man, this motherfucker is good. Like you know what I mean. And I'm not the I'm not the type of person that's gonna walk up to somebody and be like, man, you you like I think you dope. Like but like right. in my mind, like this motherfucker is he legit, like he's super underrated. Yeah. But those three guys, like they love the game for sure. Talk about you just talk about um, you know, those guys when they were traded in New York. But talk yeah. about because it was funny because I remember being down in the city with you and and, and remember you saying something like, damn, I think. I think you were saying something about being traded or something where it was yeah. talking, being talked yeah, about. So that, so, so that whole year, like, they wanted Melo, of course, yeah. and he wanted to come to New York. So, like, at some point, like, we knew, like, it was going to be a trade. We just didn't know what the trade was going to look like, who was going to be in the actual trade. But you know how the, like, the media is. Names pop up. And my name popped up a lot. And I, was, and I was like, man, I was frustrated that whole season. I had a good season, but I didn't want to leave New York, man. Like, um, yeah, shit. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, every day, like I would read because you know the New York papers is like harsh, man. Like, every day I read this shit, like, damn, man, I'm gonna go to Denver. Like, and it was crazy because how politics work. I'm talking, I'm talking to Donnie Walsh, who was our gym at the time, and this later in the season, I think right before All Star. You know, we was talking, and he was just like, man, you know, I'm gonna do every day in my power. Like, I'm not gonna trade you. Like, you good? Like, you know. I mean, so I'm thinking like in my head, like this before I'm I'm green. Like this is my first team. I'm like, I'm thinking like oh, I'm at this point, I'm good. I'm, like I'm Donnie Walsh, man. He said I'm here, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember coming back from All Star break and Amari wasn't at practice, right? And I'm like, damn, why Amari not here? But I'm thinking like, damn, it was All Star. Maybe he like his flight or something, or maybe they just gave him a day off and he needs to rest or whatever. But the GMs, like, they normally would come watch practice here and there, but they wasn't there, and Amari wasn't there. So I just remember the whole vibe of practice, and it was just off. And I'm like, damn, this shit about to happen, right? Because trade deadline is, like, in a few days. So I'm like, this shit about to happen. 
So I remember after practice, we in the locker room and like it just quiet in there. And I remember Raymond Felton playing around was like, cause his name never came up in the trades. So he was playing around like, oh yeah, Will, they trade y'all, they gonna have to trade me too. Uh, we like we lifers. And I was like, and I'm thinking like, man, this is not a laughing matter. So I went home and I went to sleep. <laughs> I went home and I went to sleep. And uh, my girlfriend at the time woke me up like, man, you just got traded to Denver. I said, get the fuck out of here. I said, oh, that's some bullshit, right? And I looked at the trade, Ray in there. So I'm just I'm like, look, that what you get for playing. For playing, facts. Yeah. So I, I remember getting on the plane the next day. And, like, you know, you get on a private, the, the team plane, you get on a private plane. And then, like, you know, he's a businessman, the owner. He's a businessman. So, like, when you get on the plane, you got all the spreads of the newspapers on there. So like every new New York newspaper, the Times, the Wall Street, Wall Street Journal, Daily News, all them shits, all that shit is on the front page. I'm just looking at the shit like, damn, I'm on my way to Denver, dog. I'm leaving New York on my way to Denver. I just we just started winning. I'm having a career year and I'm going to Denver. And I just like looking back on it, like I I went about it the wrong way. Like I was in Denver seven and a half years, and not one of those years no matter what I said to the media, like, I didn't want to be there. I never embraced being there. And like, if I could, if I got one regret in life is that like, I was in a place where they wanted me at, that, you know, they, they would do pretty much anything I wanted them to do. And I wasn't even a superstar or a star. And I just never embraced being there. And I regret that. I think I would have had a better career if I would have embraced being in Denver. Like it wasn't one day I was in Denver that I wanted to be there. Damn, that's crazy. And, that, and eventually that should have, like, it'll eat you alive. Like, you know, like, you can cope with it and you can play good for years. But, like, once you get into your six, seven, like, that shit get, like, it started eating at you mentally. Like, I was, like, nobody knew. Like, I was depressed, like, the whole, like, literally depressed the whole time I was in Denver. I just never liked being there. And um, looking back at it, like, it was the worst, like, that was the worst, like, decision I ever made, like, to – had that mindset when I was there because everybody there was like kind to me. Everybody was nice to me. Like they did a hell of shit they didn't have to do for me. And I just kind of was like, man, I do not want to be here. What do, what do you think it was though? Because shit, you, you was killing in Denver because you, yeah, six, yeah. six of those seven seasons, you averaged double figures, bro. Like high yeah, double figures, yeah. you know what I'm saying? And you was kind of playing through injury too at some of those times. Yeah, yeah, no, I was, I was hurt a lot. <laughs> In Denver. Uh, I was hurt a lot. I had two hip surgeries. Um, so, I mean, I was hurt a lot, but I don't, I don't, to be honest. Did that add to it, bro? Did that add yeah. to it probably a little bit? Just being, having to go through that? Because yeah. those are some fucking tough injuries, like the Bo Jackson shit. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, that definitely add, adds to it when you have uh, major surgeries. I mean, Johnny Flynn had the same shit, actually. Right. Uh, that's a few people that had it. Yeah, they had it, Isaiah Thomas. I mean, even though he's looking good now, but look how long it took him to get back right. Um, I had both. I had both my hips. I think that played a big part. I think, too, like, realizing the business of basketball, like, you know, I think a lot of that shit had to do with the business of basketball and how they told me they wasn't going to trade me. And just like, we went through those tough years in New York. And then that last year we was winning, I was playing great, having a career year. And then I get traded like, damn, they just kind of threw me away. I think that had, and I think it kind of played to some shit that I had never addressed with childhood trauma shit, you know, with my parents. I was raised by my grandparents and it was like, my mom and my dad kind of just threw me away. So I think like a lot of shit like played into that. And I think like the culture of Denver, like it's not a, like you go to you go to school in Chicago, then you go to New York. Like those, like culturally, like you have a lot. It's like a big mixing pot. Denver is like kind of like is what it is. It's like an outdoors type kind of city. It's a white city uh, majority, and I think it was just a mixture of different things. And like you know, I just never, I just never embraced being there, and I should have, because I was somewhere where I was thriving, even with all that shit going on in my head. I was still th- thriving, and. Um, they wanted me to be there. I was there seven and a half years. Like, so obviously they wanted me to be there. You know what I mean? And signed big signed your big contract there. Yeah, I signed my biggest contract there. Yeah, definitely. And and it's crazy. They didn't have to even sign. I signed the extension. I wasn't even up, you know, like uh they didn't have to do that. 
and he was a new GM. He had just got there. That was the first one of the first things he did when he was there to sign uh, me to an extension. And that was uh, Yuri, uh, Tim Conley. Tim Conley. Oh, he's still there right yeah. now. He's still right there now. He, yeah. Is he right now? Yeah, he, he's there now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You, yeah. Um, but you're talking about Arturis, but he was so he brought Arturis in, so he was the assistant GM. So basically, right. him and uh, Tim, and he's he's over in um, in Chicago now. But it must you talk? Oh no, no, you said jury. Uh, you talking about Masai? Man, he's, a, he's a, okay. yeah. He he's the one who made the trade. You know, uh, he made he made the trade from us to, for us to go to Denver from uh, New York, and um, I was with him for a long time, and then he took the Toronto job, and then that's when Tim Conley came in. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Y'all, you had some shit. I mean, bro, y'all had some good teams in Denver too. Like especially yeah, no, we had some Western we had Conference. some great teams. Yeah, we had some great teams. It's just the Western Conference was so stacked. You know, when I first got there, you know, Melo and them guys left, but we still had KMR and we still had Jared Smith and fucking we had Andre Miller for a moment. We had Ty Lawson. And then we like that, we blew that and Al Harrington. We blew that team up and then when the well, when they traded for Igadala, we didn't have a lot of big names, but it was a lot of motherfuckers that just played hard and played together and played basketball the right way. We had Iguodala, we had um, we had Gallinari, we had Ty Lawson, Corey Brewer, Jabel McGee, Kenneth Farid, and it was just like a, a bunch of motherfuckers who just played hard. Really. Yeah, and we ended up being a, the third seed that year. You know, we lost to eventually we lost to the Warriors in the first round, but it kind of yeah. You ever we had some we had some good teams. Yeah, that had, I averaged 12 or 13 that year off, off of hip surgery. Yeah, that shit hard to do. And, and you yeah. and you got the uh, – I guess you was – and I think it was 2017, I'm going to say. You was you got to see, like, the young Jokic. Like, yeah, so I, I was I was there. I was there with Jokic for, for a while, actually. Uh, so he came in. He was a second-round pick. And what happened is like, he was always good, but the reason why he was able to showcase his talent – being the second round pick, everybody ended up getting hurt. So you know he played, and then um, obviously after that, it's like we got to play him. <laughs> so everybody come back, and it was like we struggled for a little bit because they was trying to figure out how to play him and Nurkic, use of Nurkic at the same time. Yeah, and it, it just wasn't a good fit. And then they they ended up trading uh, Nurkic and um, and double down on on Joker, which was the right decision. But you could see it from day one, though. With him, it was always just, you know, being in shape, but, like, the talent was there right up, right off. And then he's, like, a people person. Like, it's hard to hate him. You know what I mean, like, when he comes in, he just has a presence. You know what I'm saying? It's like that. He has that Magic Johnson. Like, I don't know if you're watching, like, the show Winning Time right now. With a, on HBO? Yeah. Yeah. I he, see had, he, he has that Magic Johnson personality, like, where he's always joking. He's always smiling. He's always in a great mood. You know what I mean? On top of his game. You know what I mean? So, he's... You could tell he has star qualities. Yeah, yeah he winning right yeah. now. Shit. He, he yeah, no, no, they, <laughs> no, they got, a, they got, a, they got a great young team. And uh, I was there with a the young Jamal Murray. You could see oh, early on that he was going to be a dog. You know what I mean? Then they, you add that with like Will Barton and make some few trades. You get then you draft uh, was it Michael Porter? So they definitely put together a nice team. You know what I mean? Just Aaron Gordon. you know, it, Aaron Gordon is a great piece. I think that was an underrated piece because now he's not the main option. You know, he's like the third option, you know what I mean? So he can kind of play to his strengths. So they That's put together a great team. They just, the last couple of years, injuries has been tough on them. Hey, what's the craziest trash talk you ever heard somebody say in the <laughs> game? Because there's some shit I, that go I, on. <laughs> yeah, I heard, I, heard, I heard a lot of crazy shit, but I think the most, like, subtle, crazy talk I ever, it was because it was so subtle and unexpected. Uh, when I was in New York, and we had Amari. We was playing Boston in Boston. And it was a close game. Like, we was, like, down, like, four, like, a couple minutes left or whatever. And somebody fouled Paul Pierce. So he had the line. So he go through his routine. He shoot the free throw, make it. So the second, you know, like, so he get the ball on the second free throw. And he's, he's like, in his dribbling. Yeah, he's taking his, like, couple dribbles or whatever. But you know how you on the side, like you lined up, like you know what I'm saying, on the on the uh, on the free throw line, you just lined up, like get ready for the rebound, right? So just regular shit. Amari like 
oh, he's going to give us one of these, but not really in the even, not even in the malice way. Like, he just saying it like, you know, like, that's what you say. Like, we're going to get one of these. Like, yeah. and he said it, and Paul Pierce stopped mid-routine, and he just looked back on, over both shoulders. He looked back. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? And he looked, and then he looked at Amari like, who are you talking to? Me? Oh, you got to be talking to Ray or somebody. Because I'd have been in too many big games for me to miss these free throws right now. He said, matter of fact, I don't even know why I'm arguing with you. I only argue with Kobe's and LeBron's. Went back to it, went back to his routine, shot it, made it. I was like, what? And then just ran back. It just ran back. And I was like, that's the most subtle gangster shit ever. Like, I don't even argue. Like, because Amari at that time averaged like 28 points, 27 points. But he like, I only argue with Kobe's and LeBron's. Like, don't even talk to me type shit. He was in his prime right then. Yeah, that's what that was uh the first year of no, that wasn't the first year of the big three. Cause they cause they they made the big three at that time when I got drafted. So that was like the second and third year. The third year of the big three or whatever. I think they won a championship that year. Or they went to the finals, they either won or lost to the Lakers, but yeah. I tell you what though, he got that shit thrown back at him that one time when when he was sitting on the bench and Draymond was saying that shit. Yeah, yeah. Him. But you, you know, know how this shit <laughs> Yeah, you know how this shit go. Like, you know, once you like, you always gonna meet your match one day. Yeah. But, you know, like Paul Pierce at that time, like that whole team though, Paul Pierce and KG together, trash talk. Oh my god. But yeah, I heard a lot of trash talk over the time. Shit internally and with other teams. Like I heard a lot of a lot of crazy shit. It's crazy because like most of the be- the best stories I probably would never tell just because it was like locker room shit. Yeah, yeah, right. Like like I would I would, I would tell like you know like my homies or like you and we was talking one on one, but just to put it out there. But I'd have heard a lot of the craziest shit I ever heard was just like with teammates arguing or coaches and team like players arguing with each other. Like to be honest. Yeah, like front, like yeah. like like uh, front, like, like the, uh, in the staff and like the front office. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like I just seen, <laughs> I just seen like you know like with Dre Miller and, and B Shaw, like that was crazy. Like that argument was super crazy. Uh, I just see disrespectful. Uh, yeah, I just seen uh, Jerome. Uh, what was Jerome last night? Uh, but him and Isaiah Thomas was about to Jerome fight James? one day in practice. Jerome James and Isaiah Thomas was about to fight <laughs> yeah. one time. <laughs> this shit, that shit him, was, it was it was he, funny as fuck, bro. He took a lot of money and they never hooped. <laughs> so he, yeah, he uh, Isaiah Thomas was salty. Yeah, that's what they say. <laughs> that's what they really my place to speak on it. But yeah, I just seen man, I just seen some funny ass shit, man. I just seen some funny shit, and I just seen some shit like, damn, this really the league, bro. Like with people, like I could write a book. Like my first two years in New York alone, I could write a book. For real, to be honest, just, through, just about those two, just those two seasons. That's what I'm talking about. Just those two seasons, everything that happened on the court and off court, and it'd be a New York Times bestseller. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like hands down, because I'm because I'm quiet, so I'm just sitting there really just watching all this shit happen, bro. Yo, like bro. the off the court shit, like people getting sued left and right, motherfuckers arguing, and like this is some of your best players, like you know what I mean? It's New York on top of that, so it's dramatized to the max. Yeah, yeah, I I remember going down and just hanging out, and like I'm like shit, you know I'm in the I'm, yeah. I'm in the queue, so I'm just like shit, I can't wait to go hop on the uh, train right quick. Go yeah, on, give me a three day weekend in, we gonna get it in. <laughs> yeah, that's a fact. Here, man. <laughs> I don't. Man, man, it's crazy because uh, man, I had a great time. The NBA was definitely uh, a, a great experience. Like, I would never trade none of that shit for the world. Like I said, I got a couple regrets, but even with that, though, I never trade none of that shit. Bro. What's the greatest lesson you learned in the NBA while playing in the league? I would say kind of staying like level headed. You know, uh, never getting too down, never getting too up. Kind of like being like as consistent as possible because it's easy like to to make that that much money coming from places like we where we come from when people don't have it like to take the money and like and kind of like just get complacent with that or with the fame or anything you know what i mean because like especially playing in like cities like new york you know what i mean like you can fall victim to a lot of shit like i think the biggest thing i just kind of like stay in the course like like this shit is cool, but like that's not what I'm here for. I can go have a good time, but I need to still like 
do what I can came here for, like, you know, be consistent, you know, uh, because like not only is it a game, like you want to win, you want to be the one of the best, but this is how you take care of your family. So you want to play as long as you can. This is how your family going to take care of their family for generations to come. Um, so it's a lot of pressure uh, you put on yourself because not only on the court do you want to be one of the best players, you want to win, you want to be a good teammate. Um, you also want to be successful, like long term off the court as well. Well, yeah, so I think consistency is the is the biggest thing I learned. Say it, because a lot of people can get caught up in that shit. You are, I mean, yeah, and it, and, it, and it was a lot of times that I thought about quitting before I actually retired when I had my hip surgeries. Like you know, like it's like when you it's out of sight, out of mind. So when I had my hip surgery, nobody know if I'm come back. Especially one year, one year I was out the whole season. Like people come visit you less, people call less. Like all the fun stopped for a while. So that was like kind of like my first introduction. Like, damn, this how this how retirement is gonna be. So like, I was able to look at it like a lot of people gonna leave once I stop playing basketball. So, bro, I want to talk about uh, Kobe a little bit because I yeah. know I was gonna ask you who's you know who's the best player you ever played against, but I'm just thinking that, that it's got to be Kobe. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, nah, yeah, definitely. Uh, Kobe to me was like how my grandmother loved Jordan. Like, I grew up with Kobe. Like, I, I, you know, when I was young, Mike was still playing. But, like, when I was able to understand, like, the game of basketball, like, Kobe was a rookie. And, you know, I kind of, like, grew up, like, watching him grow through his career. You know I mean, he was I, – I, growing up, I never watched a lot of basketball outside with my grandma. But when Kobe started playing, when he got drafted, I would faithfully watch – I would watch all Kobe games. So, that I kind of grew up, like, idolizing Kobe. So, that's he's my he's my Michael Jordan like how people like had this nostalgic thing with Michael Jordan that's what Kobe is to me and I think like the people in my generation and after so I mean definitely I would say Kobe's the best player I played against. What 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 was it? what I mean I mean people know but they don't really yeah. know like the details what separated him from everybody else bro even from like him from like a. Uh, like you said, a Paul Pierce or somebody like that. Yeah. he was another level up. Yeah, it was a, it was another level up. It was like Kobe. Then everybody else was under that. Not saying they wasn't great as well, but just Kobe is another level up. Just you you take Michael Jordan and you put Michael Jordan there, and then you give Michael Jordan more handle. You give Michael Jordan a better three ball. You know what I mean? That was Kobe. That he had that same he had the same athleticism as Mike. He had. The same drive, the winning spirit, the competitiveness of Mike. Um, he had everything. Mike had the footwork that Mike had, but he had a better handle than Mike, and he had a better three ball than Mike. Yeah. I mean, so you just add. Not saying that you know he's better than Jordan or Jordan's better than him, but that's just the reality of it. Like when when you look at the film, like his handle was better than Mike. Like early Kobe, like his handle was crazy. Um, you know it, shit, firsthand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he shot the three. He shot more threes, and he shot the three better than Mike. Uh, so everything that Mike could do, you add those two elements to it, that was Kobe. And then, like, Kobe was like, it don't matter. Like, you can never have an off play with Kobe. Like, Kobe could go zero for 20. In the fourth quarter, he going to heat up at some point. And he's gonna take it. Like a lot of guys, they go, they miss a few shots and it's kind of they kind of like take a step back, like let me play the right way. Like I'm taking too many shots. And I ain't making it right now. Yeah. Now with Kobe. Now with Kobe. <laughs> he all <laughs> he, he always he always a kill mode. He always got the killer instinct at all times. He a dog. That's the separate. Yeah, he is a dog. Yeah. He don't give a yeah. fuck. Yeah. Yeah. That's the same. Yeah. Bro, let's talk about uh those two years or year and a half that you spent outside of the league playing in China. Yeah. And, and like the, just the difference. I mean, the first year was kind of, I think it was like the, the lockout, right? The lockout. Yeah. The lockout. But then this past, it was recent. Most recent was like right kind of in the middle of like COVID, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, 2020. Yeah. Yeah. You, know, you go through all the last time I played. Talk about yeah. those two, those two times you played in China and the experience. Uh, you had. So the first time, I went was doing the lockout. So I got traded to Denver. We finished that season out and then the lockout happened that summer. So I um so I'm sitting there. 
I was in Miami at the time and I'm talking to Greer and he like, uh, man, I got a situation for you. It might be good. This is before anybody decided to go overseas. I was actually the first person to sign to play overseas. And he like, man, you know, you ain't made a lot of money yet. I mean, I made a lot of money, like, in comparison to, like, the average person. But, like, far as, like, big contracts go, um, I didn't have one. So, he like, you know, it's good money. It's tax-free. But you got to go to China. So, I'm like, China. So, I'm like, damn. I'm like, I'd rather really play than work out all the time, for real. So, I'm like, fuck it. I'll go. And, you know, I, I was a good player, but I wasn't a big player. So, it didn't. It, it made some headlines, but it wasn't a big thing. I think it wasn't a big thing until, like, G.R. Smith announced, like, right after me he was going. And then I think uh, Darren Williams decided to go play in Turkey. And then a lot more guys came to China. So it, it, it ended up becoming a big – yeah, yeah, okay, Martin. It ended up becoming a big thing. Uh, shit, Aaron Brooks. It was a few – it was a few people that went over and played. But it was a great experience. I think I was there too long. Seven months is a long time to be in China. But uh, – <laughs> I think it was it was a it was a great experience though. I was able to travel and see the country, see different cities, uh, uh, learn about the culture, you know, uh, try new foods. Like it was a great experience. I had a good time. You know, I was just over there too long, but other than that, I had a good time. And then most recently, I went. So I, I was on the edge. Like when I left Denver, I was like kind of like on the line. Like I want to retire, but I'm not gonna retire. Kind of like just being kind of nervous, like what my life was going to look like next, like outside of basketball, because that's all I know is basketball. So I played those last couple of years, and it was kind of like I was going back and forth. So once COVID hit and – And you were still kind of hurt, though, too, bro, right? Like Yeah, so yeah, so when I was in, when I was in Philly, when I was in Philly, I tore, I tore my main quad muscle. Like, I'm not a yeah. muscle guy, so I don't know which muscle that is, but it's my main muscle. And I tore, like, to the part where – to the point where my muscle literally rolled up my leg and I got, like, a big hematoma at the top of my – my my thigh. And I'm I'm missing, like, a a piece of muscle on my thing. So that took my athleticism away after that. Uh, So I was battling with that that year and the year I was in in Brooklyn. So um, when COVID came, you know, that was kind of like – it, you know, it was like, oh, we're gonna go to a bubble, we're gonna do woo to woo. And I'm like, uh <laughs> <laughs> I ain't really feeling that, you know what I'm saying? And I'm already on the edge, like I kind of don't want to play no more for real, to be honest. But it's like I'm looking at it from like I still could bring something to the table, you know what I'm saying? Next year we're gonna have a healthy KD, healthy Kyrie. So I'm really just trying to hold on to the year and get through the year so I can play next year with a healthy Kyrie and KD. Like hopefully that like I can get a chip, even if I'm sitting on the bench for real. But, like, I'm also, like, man, like, what am I doing this shit for? Like, you know what I mean? So, it was, like, when COVID hit and they was, like, we're going to go to a bubble, I'm, like, I ain't feeling that getting tested every day. Like, teachers, on, like, I'm, I'm not, like, I'm not, I don't want to go to a bubble where I'm isolated in a room or a, a space and get tested every day like a lab monkey, bro. I'm, like, I'm good. <laughs> so, I, I was, like, man, I told them I don't want to go. So they let me go home or whatever. I had to forfeit my contract, which a lot of people don't know. I had to give, like, I didn't make no money that year because I was suspended to start the year. Yeah. And then I decided not, not to go to to, uh, to the bubble, so I lost the money for the rest of the year. And so I'm at home in, in Detroit, and uh, my old team <laughs> from China reached out to me, like, oh, we see you not going to the bubble. Like, you should come over here and play. And at first, I'm like, Nah, did I the long? You know how it is. Like when you first stop playing basketball, you think that's what you want to do. And I'm like, damn, I kind of like do want to like play. And I'm like, it's China. It's not as serious as the league. I can go over there and play, and like still be effective for real. But they lied to me. They like, yeah, you no, know, every day is good. Like you know, regular. So when I get there, first of all, it took me forever to get my uh my visa this time, like four months or whatever, because of COVID. So I get my visa, so I get there, and then as soon as I get off the plane, you know, a lot of them don't know English, like, uh, at the airport, and I don't know Chinese, so I get off the plane, and they're just pushing me, and I'm like, where we going? <laughs> and it's like, everybody got these suits on, like, you know, uh, like these, uh, I don't even know what you call hazardous them. Hazardous suit joints, yeah. Yeah, the hazardous suits, they just pushing me, right? They like, it's like a, it's like a camp there, and they're like, they're just pushing people, like, you go here, you go there, so I'm like, what? So, like, you... As soon as you get off, you got to quarantine for two weeks. But you don't get to choose, like, your destination. Like, 
if you go into a certain part of the country and you go to a certain area, but you don't get to choose your hotel, you don't get to choose like your room, none of that. They just put you wherever they want to put you. So they, I was, <laughs> I'm literally on the bus, like, I don't know what hotel I'm going to. No, nothing. I'm texting the team like, oh, yeah, you just got to do the court. They act like it's no big deal. Just do the court here for two weeks. So they put me in this room, bro. Literally nobody in the hotel knows English. So I'm just in this room for two weeks. I can't I can't pick the food I want to eat. They just break. They just knocking on my door like twice a day or three times a day, wherever it is. And they just dropping food at the door. And it's like, oh, shit, I don't eat. I'm like, damn, fucking stop. So I'm just really eating rice. I'm just really eating rice for two weeks every day. And uh, then they'd come and they'd, they'd uh, take your temperature and do like the whole COVID test. So I did that for the first two weeks. So then it was like this big thing. Like, they didn't know if we were going to be able to play. So I'm waiting like another like two, three weeks after I get out of quarantine. And the team is like traveling and playing. So I'm I'm practicing with like the younger team. You know how it is when you go overseas. Like they got a whole like a 16-year-old, 17-year-old team. Like they groom and they'll be like pros or whatever. Yeah. So I'm practicing with them. And then the team finally come back. So I'm practicing with them. And then I hear, like, the translators say some shit like, oh, yeah, when we, we get ready to leave next week. And I'm like, we got a game on the road? He's like, no, 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 no. We got to go to the bubble. So I immediately look like, a oh, bubble? Now, y'all didn't tell me about this. <laughs> <laughs> you just come yeah. from that shit. Yeah, yeah. Like, so I'm like, oh, so that's already strike one. So, But I'm there already. It's China. I can't, I can't up and leave. So that's already strike one. And then I end up hurting my knee like the. Because, you know, over there, you just practice. Like, they just like, run you into the ground. You practice twice a day, every day, no days off. So, like, I end up, like, messing my knee up. And it's just, it keeps swelling up. I play – I think I played, like, two or three games. I'm like, man, you know what? I need to get an MRI. So, I get an MRI over there. I send it back to the States because I don't trust them. And, you know, basically, I need surgery. But they think I'm lying. Like, so now <laughs> – that's, like, December 2nd. So, I'm stuck over there from December 2nd to December – 30th or whatever like I'm not playing I'm not going to the games or practice we just kind of in like this whole like this whole beef I'm just literally in the room playing the game like they won't let me leave I'm not I'm I'm being stubborn I'm not going to the games or practice I need surgery so it's like I'm just stuck there bro they holding me hostage for real so I end up leaving I end up calling a travel agent I use when I played in the league she booked me a flight I used my google translator I ordered me like a taxi and I just dipped for real. I left my bags and everything because they wasn't letting me leave. I just dipped. <laughs> <laughs> I'm there. I'm there for weeks, bro. And I'm just there, <laughs> and nobody they know because like my grandma. I don't want to tell nobody because like you got COVID going on, you got the election going on. Like I don't want nobody to worry. Like they they holding me against my will. So I'm like I didn't tell nobody I was going through that. So only me, Greer, and my financial advisor knew for real. I'm really stuck over there. Everybody asking how it's going. I'm like it's going cool. I'm really a. <laughs> I'm really a prisoner for real. <laughs> <laughs> you got, you know, it's like a, it's like a, a motherfucker right. next to you with, with a gun to your head, be like, "Oh yeah, I'm straight, motherfucker." Yeah. Not to that extent, but you know what I mean. So, I, so I, I did, bro. I just left all my bags, bro. I left all my bags. I gave my video games to like uh, one of the players, and I just called a car service, bro. And I dipped and I left my bags. I got on a flight, and I flew from Shanghai to San Francisco, San Francisco to DC, DC to. Gulf Breeze, and I went down there and I had my surgery. I had my surgery New Year's Eve on my knee. And I just decided there, I was like, man, I'm done. Like, I'm done with basketball. And now, like, now I'm retired. And I didn't I didn't even announce. I just, like, I just stopped. And that, what, that was it. What, so, I mean, talk about that, bro. Like, like you done hooping. Yeah. Um, and like you just can't you coming from China like that, you, you go through all that shit. So you're already frustrated. So that yeah. kind of that added into like, you know, up, up on top of the injuries and stuff, like, all right, man, it's time to yeah. transition. How hard is that, bro? Like, cause because a lot of dudes struggle with it, bro, especially mentally, yeah. like you playing basketball your whole life. This is like bro, I, we ain't never had no job, regular job. Like, yeah. you know, kids growing up, they get yeah. job at McDonald's. But nah, we yeah. was hooping like ever since and I yeah. still ain't never had no regular job. Yeah, <laughs> but, but hooping. So like, how? Yeah, when it's done and then you got to transition, you know, into something different. How hard is that for you? And, and I guess, what advice do you have for for guys that are dealing with that or or about to go through that? Uh, it's hard because it's like it's a situation where it's like um, that you know it's gonna come to an end one day, but we all like never like 
prepared. Like we all we always think like in our minds gonna like even though we see this shit happen every year with players, we think it's gonna last forever. Like we just live in a moment, right? And then so when that happened, I'm sitting there, I'm like, damn, I think I'm about to retire or whatever. So you know, everybody gonna try to talk you out of, especially people who make money from it. like the people you that that you take care of your finance people, your ages, all of them like, nah, you got you got something left for the tape. Like, you know, because right. like it's it's been a, like they do, they they probably do generally want you to keep playing, but also it's something beneficial there for them too, right? No doubt. And then you got you got people who never played it in the NBA that might have played basketball, who didn't play basketball, like who always wanted that, whether it was the money, the lifestyle, or just to play basketball in the NBA. So you got those people in your family, your friends, like, no, nah, you should keep playing. Like, why would you want to quit playing basketball? So pretty much it's like you got people telling you shit that you don't want to do. Like nobody's listening to the reason why, like, what's best for you, what's best, like what you want to do. Like you just got those people. So it's tough from that standpoint. And also, too, like, like you said, we always – we grew up playing basketball. That's all we know from junior high to high school to college to NBA. Like, that's, that's our identity. Like people, like – when people see you now, like people know you as Eric Devendorf that played Syracuse, like you know what I'm saying, that went which are six overtimes uh, at, at the yeah. garden. Like people know, like they know certain parts of your career, like, and that's what they kind of identify with when they see you. Yeah. So you struggle with that too. Like, damn, if I retire, like people only know me as Wilson Chandler, like the basketball player. So you struggle with that. And you know, you struggle with, like even simple shit, like if you got kids or you got a girl, like you used to live in life on the go. So like you deal with them. You know what I'm saying? In spurts. Now you're around certain people full time. So now you gotta develop these relationships all over. Like you gotta kind of get the like get to know them. Like, all right, what are you doing? Like when I'm going on the road, like what are you doing with your life? Like you got that. And then like kind of like, oh, what I want to do with myself. Like, if you're not prepared, like if you don't have anything going on at the moment, so you gotta kinda like figure it out then. Like, so you got like time. You're sitting there thinking, like, what do I wanna do? Like, what am I passionate about? Cause it's all about passion. It gotta be something you're passionate about. You doing when you're done playing. It. Cause if it's about the money or any other thing, like you're not really gonna be into it. You know what I mean? So I say that I think the biggest. No, nah, and it's it's a struggle mentally. Like even now, like you know, I do cannabis, but like every day I'm still looking for like that passion, that passion project. Like what am I passionate about? That's gonna give me that same like thrill as basketball. And like it's cool, like your body feel good when you first retire because you're sitting around, you're not pounding on it. But after you get used to that, you like in your mind, like, damn, you're so used to like doing shit every day. You're like, man, like I'm just really sitting around doing nothing, even if you are, like, cause you just used to that routine, like grinding it out, traveling, working out, playing. So you feel unproductive the days where you like sitting around resting or you sitting around your family. Yeah, like, you, you don't, you don't, you don't. You don't even live in the moment. You can't even sit there and like enjoy your family and your friends because you thinking like, man, I need to be doing something, bro. Yes, bro. Yeah, that's, um, bro, that's crazy, bro. That that because like even like if you you have a day where you busy as shit, you run around and then like you know like it's it's cool to take a day to rest your mind, but then like yeah. you said, resting your mind, you almost feeling guilty like you ain't yeah shit done or accomplishing something because we so used to like the routine for the from the hoop shit. Like, oh, I got yeah. my workout done. I got my my. Uh, rehab done or whatever it is, and then you know, go on to the game. It's like you feel accomplished now. Like you got to change your whole mindset into into something different. You know what I mean? And it's the yeah. slow pace too. Yeah, now nah, much slower place. Even and even too, like you get, you don't realize how many like positive affirmations you get as an athlete, like from your teammates, and your coach, like good job, right. this and that. Like when you do shit now, like regularly, like you know what I'm saying. People expect you to do shit in the, in the real world, so it's like you don't get that man, appreciate it. Thank you. Good job. Like, so like a lot of little shit, like, like, damn, like, you know, um, so yeah, it's, it's a definitely a mental struggle, but I would say like, if I had any advice for, I know it's cliche, but it's like, like start planning like your exit strategy, like years, years before you're done playing, like, if you can, like try to figure out what your, uh, what your likes and dislikes are, what your uh, passions are, you know what I mean? What makes sense for you? Kind of like you know, and networking too. Like once, because everybody wants to be around athletes. So if you network early on, like you know, we seen it. Like look at Benny Johnson. Like he made more money than he can ever imagine off the court. You know, after he uh, retired, you know what I mean. And there's a lot of stories like that, just from networking. So uh, I would say definitely networking to just kind of figure out your exit strategy. You know what I'm saying beforehand, if you can. Yeah, that's that's something yeah. that I really. 
learned is is relationships is everything and like you said like we we already had this platform and and you being in the nba your platform is like international yeah. worldwide like i was lucky enough to like at, at Cuse, like you know how passionate they are about they hoop here so i got yeah. a little platform here to where i could go ahead move around a little bit more yeah. than that the average person and do but but like you said it's it's all about relationships and then too bro like a lot of the times you know how athletes are they some are more close you know they're not open to a lot of people now when when you when you getting out in the business world it's more so shaking hands and then you almost relearning some shit or or, or learning different shit you know what i mean so now you yeah. instead of you being kind of like the alpha you kind of you got to kind of sit back and almost yeah. learn from this motherfucker who can't jump over a broomstick <laughs> yeah now you definitely become a student <laughs> you become the student man it's a whole different ball game i think that shit like kind of eat at your ego and your mental too if you can't That's handle it like you know like because you got to go to them you know what i mean now you got to go to them. You got to learn from them. You got to kind of like, you know, it's a different ball game, like you said. So that's uh, that's tough as well. But like me, I'm a type of person. I don't really mind that. Like, you know, being like that person to fly on the room in the wall. I mean, to fly on the wall in the room, kind of learning. Um, I think the hardest thing for me was actually being vocal and, and having to like to, to build those, those relationships like post like NBA. You know what I mean? Because I don't really talk too much. Like I talk to like my people that I'm close with, but it's hard for me to open up, like, you know, so uh, that's been my biggest struggle, like, having to, like, make those relationships and, like, kind of build it to where, like, we got some motion going on. So. And, and the trust, too, bro, like, because, like yeah. you said, like, growing up, you've been through some shit or, or and then you put trust in people who, yeah. you know, didn't give you that trust back or whatever. So now, yeah. you know, it, it's hard to just meet somebody for the first time and then open up all the way and expect them, like, oh, you know, kind of drop everything and just... You know, yeah. that's not part of your life, you know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And they like, you know how this shit go. Like with same with athletes, like a lot of people want to be around them. Um, but the same with business, like everybody always got the best big opportunity for an athlete because you got so much money. Like you get so much janky like shit thrown at you on a consistent basis, and you get and sometimes you get burnt by that. So like you kind of like on guard from that as well. I don't know, I don't know if you it's this movie. He's like the main uh, actor in it, but it's this one scene like he's in the, he's in the club and like people got all these ideas and it's like they just throwing it at him. Like one dude like, oh, for this amount of money we could buy all the water on the internet. And then like the chick come to him like, you want to have sex? I can't have. Don't worry about. It. I can't have babies. My pussy broke. <laughs> like you know, it's like people got all these ideas. Like you get so much shit thrown at you. Like so, I, I definitely. Uh, Put you on guard, like you said. Uh, like you said it's hard to trust people sometimes. Yeah, no doubt. But and then yeah. on the other hand, you do kind of like have to drop that ego a little bit, and then be willing to like open up a little bit, and then and yeah. then almost almost be willing to like, I guess not get hurt, but take that chance and take that risk to see yeah. how this shit goes. But then again, you gonna. You gonna feel the energy yeah. and all that as well. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, I, I feel like in any any field, especially business, like you gotta take those risks. You know, say so you gotta take some losses, you gotta take some bumps and bruises. It's, it's like anything. You gotta gotta build that uh, that portfolio, build up a resume. You know, what I mean, there's, there's some shit that's gonna work out, and there's some shit that's not. So I think that's just part of it. You know, what I mean, and trying the best, trying your best is to identify like who the right people to uh, brush shoulders with and who to get in bed with. Yeah, facts. Bro, last question I'm gonna get you about here. You you kinda you talked about uh you being involved with the cannabis company uh Viola who started Harrington. I know that's involved and that it's yeah. really like grown to be one of the biggest uh cannabis companies in this in the country. And I know he's, yeah. he's starting to do stuff internationally. What what's something that uh you know going forward that you really want to accomplish business wise? You know, you've accomplished so much hooping in, in basketball. Yeah. And now you you taking that into the business world. What's something that you really want to accomplish, either with Viola or you know with something else? Um, I don't think I don't have anything specific, but I do have an idea of how I want it to go. Um, so like I love music, um, I love art, I love all these different things, and I think before it was a visual thing or you know uh, or what I would hear, but now like the more I get into all these different things, it's like with with basketball. It's like people eventually forget, right? Unless you like LeBron, Kobe, 
majority. Like, they leave their imprint on the game. Most role players, you couldn't tell me. Most people couldn't tell me, like, who was, like, who was on the front team like they played against like the, the trailblazers the team that jordan beat in the finals besides like clyde drexler and a couple other players they couldn't Very tell important. me the players <laughs> they, they, yeah you know what i mean they couldn't tell me the players on the bench so eventually right. like that should have go away but the thing i like about with like you know whether it's um activists or art or music like these people leave an imprint you know forever like you know what i'm saying like People still know who Jimi Hendrix is, Nina Simone is. People still know who Malcolm X is or uh, Angela Davis or, you know, Basquiat. I think, like, for me, it's, like, kind of, like, trying to figure out, um, like, what I'm going to do that's going to make me happy, but also, like, how can I make a a, a positive impact, you know, um, to younger generations? And, like, you know, even if it's, like, not me, like, my name, but something I'm involved with, like this company or this organization leaves an imprint, you know, um, in history. I think that's what it, that's not I think I never in basketball I didn't win a championship, you know, uh, and I wasn't a superstar. So like, I think mentally like you still like drive like for that success no matter if it's off the court or on the court. You know what I mean? So I think that's something like I want to accomplish, you know, before I get up out of here. Yeah, you. I mean, bro, you was definitely a superstar uh, hooper wise. I yeah. know the league is so many motherfuckers who can can yeah. to do what you did and accomplish what you yeah. did. Like, bro, you nobody do that for real, especially coming from no, yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah, that, yeah, definitely. Uh, that's definitely a fact. Um, uh, I look at it that way, you know. I know, I know, as people out there look at it that way as well. But you know, just like you know, on a general, you know, on the on the on the mass scale, I'm saying. But no, definitely, like I don't never take none of that for granted or with the, you know, like, if you play one year in the league, in my book, like, you accomplished it, like, because they, they had this one thing, and they was, uh, they was coming around, they do all these talks, like, uh, during the season with the NBPA, like, they do these talks about finances, some sex education, some is about just, like, watching, like, when we're talking about watching out for people with all these great ideas of women or whatever it is, so they had these talks, and then, uh, I don't know what this specific talk was about, but this was the first time I ever got asked this question, and they asked, us we was in charlotte i remember this we was in charlotte and um after shoot around or after practice we was in the hotel in the conference room and uh they asked us how many players do we think have played in the history of basketball so they went around the room and everybody guessed and i never been asked i never even thought about it yeah i knew it wasn't that many but i, I think i said like twenty thousand or something crazy like that because you thinking like if the NBA started in 19, whatever, and all the teams and, like, the expansions and everything, it's like, and people, like, that enter the draft every year worldwide. So I'm thinking, like, 20,000, right? So everybody answered. I forget what the answer was, but it was low as shit. And I was like, damn. It was like, it wasn't even close to 10,000. Damn. <laughs> right i was that because it's 400 something in the league maybe they're not counting the people who get cut and don't finish a full year or all that right yeah so i'm and i'm just thinking like damn man that's a a huge ass accomplishment bro and then like, on you know top of that you played 13 years yeah that's what i'm saying the average, <laughs> you know what i'm saying that's yeah average I, I think that, yeah i think the average years at that time i think it's going up but i think at that time it was like three and a half four years with the average nba career Oh, yeah, definitely uh, beat all the odds. So I'm not saying it from a standpoint that what I did wasn't great. Just, you know, just kind of like what's next and what I'm going to leave my imprint, like outside of basketball, like how I'm going to help the next person. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, just, but just having those thoughts in your head is already like the beginning stages of something great. You know what I'm saying? Because that's how that's yeah. how. All right, now it's just about putting the puzzle together. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. It, yeah, I think, yeah, and I think now everybody kind of like having this shift because you have access to so much shit you can see through social media or through other like uh, resources. And uh, I mean, you're doing a lot of good stuff off the court. A lot of people are starting to do, I think, a little bit more because you can see like now, like you knew it already, but now it's kind of like in your face, like everything that's going on in the world. Like, so yeah, I think everybody's trying to like figure out like how can I help the world. That's but and that's what it, I mean because everybody has a different definition of success, bro. Money, yeah. 
uh, you know, health, whatever, whatever it is. But I guess just mine and the, what I figure out is what, you know, what would really make, what really makes me happy. Because look, we, like all the shit, like when you play basketball, you win, it's, you have a good game, you score 30, like that's happiness, but it's all like temporary shit. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like yeah. the shit that everybody like strives for is like that, that happy, because it's, it's always like this, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. it's, it's never going to be happy, like every single day, all, all single. So can I find yeah. that one, one thing that I love to do that you talk about that I have passion about that's going to make me happy. And for me, it was like doing shit for other people or, or, you know, putting shit together that, you know, other people can benefit off of it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Or, or giving back through who? Through basketball, teaching the kids. So, like, I guess right. everybody just trying to find their lane to where they can have that happiness and, and then have that peace of mind with it. Like, damn, I, I feel like I'm making a difference, making an impact. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I agree. So, yeah, bro, I, I appreciate you coming on, bro. That was that was a dope convo, man. I ain't think it was yeah. going that long. Um, that's all good <laughs> uh, I, I appreciate you bro yeah. uh, taking the time out and uh you get that get that surgery done so you could uh get back to running and all that shit man yeah nah, i definitely appreciate appreciate you fellas for sure i had a great time it was a good convo so i'm good man no doubt bro appreciate you man yeah, yeah for sure